those of you who like to understand where, you know, the transition from where we are now to where we're going, it is possible to map the current six global outcomes into these new three strategic themes. Uh, and I won't go through this in detail, but um, understand that we're not losing any of the core activities that we're currently focusing on. It's just a sort of a reorganisation into something that's a, a little bit of a stronger framework. And the next phase of the activity on this 2018-2020 uh, strategy and planning framework will be presented to the World Board meeting that's happening in October this year. So that's after all the region conferences. So the region conferences themselves are opportunities now for you to um, contribute through your discussions on your forward-looking plans for the region in how, the, what the shape will take, uh, what shape the, the global strategy and planning framework will take. So you have breakout sessions um, later this afternoon and tomorrow morning, I believe, on looking forward at, at your uh, regional strategy. And any ideas and information you, you discuss there, we'll pick that up and feed it back into the global work uh, that's under, being undertaken on our strategy and planning framework. And of course then the full integrated plan will be presented at the World Conference next year in 2017. So in conclusion then, in, in order to highlight our movement's value to society, we must first be able to fully dis demonstrate our ability to impact the lives of girls in their community through our core values, through our deep commitment to improving people's lives. <clears throat> And in order to increase our movement's value to society, we must consciously and consistently grow our own internal capabilities. We must anticipate and overcome risks and threats to our movement, uh, to our movement's reach, and, and, and build effectiveness in, in our systems, in the way that we support each other. And in order to connect our movement's value to society to the areas of greatest need and impact, we must remain flexible and attentive to our stakeholders' interests. So at a global level, our stakeholders are our member organisations. At, at a member organisation level, obviously you have uh, girls, parents, boys, governments, many other uh, stakeholders that you need to consider when you're building your own strategies. But we need to um, remain open to their interests. We need to be open to learning new skills. We need to be open to being adaptable and flexible as the world around us changes. So the urgency to impact, grow and connect applies to every single one of us at a national, regional and global level. And it's only by all of us working in harmony towards the same mission and goals, each in our own unique and diverse way of course, but working together towards a similar mission, the same mission, that the movement will be recognised for its universal and collective value to society. So that gives you a high level introduction to where we're sitting at a global level. Now, Karina is going to share with you the work that's been undertaken at the region level. Thank you, Natasha. So I will now show you how um, the regional strategy is going to fit with all and that Natasha said, but also especially where you see the connection to what was um, presented to you yesterday. Because we um, proposed to you that we would keep the same three topics, um, gender diversity and growth, as we had in this triennium, and that we would implement what you've just heard from Natasha by focusing on those three um, thematic strategies. And I think, as you've seen yesterday, we spent quite a lot of time in this triennium to do the groundwork on those three topics. So we collected information, we educated ourselves in the topics, um, but we also brought good people together to start doing the work on developing the strategies in those three areas. Um, and they developed strategies and plans for the way forward. And we're really, really glad to have core groups, volunteer pools and the task forces that develop those strategies. Um, and if you think, well, we're all gone at the end of this conference, well, those volunteers um, were recruited to stay on until the end of the year in order to give the new committee a chance 
to get into everything, um, but the work will still continue and the money still spent, and you will still get um, the support needed in those three topics. So the work isn't going to stop just because we're gone. Um, and because the new committee first has to get organized, but we really can rely on really good volunteers um, to take, like to close that gap. So what do we want to achieve as a region? Um, so by the end of the triennium, we really want to have retained all member organizations. We want to gain new full members. We want to expand geographically, and I think for us all, it's really, really nice to see that there's people in this room now um, who might be the first step to this geographical expansion of Europe region. Um, but we also, and that's really an important piece of work, um, hope that MOs will be able to retain members and grow in numbers. So the plans are set up to develop like you have heard yesterday from Amanda, that huge plan, remember you had that road and then at the end you have all those things that are going to happen. I'm not sure I covered all of them there because their plans are so immense. Um, but I really think it's all a continuation of what we had. Um, the Mentors Working Group is going to play a tremendous role in that. And to continue to work with MOs to give them tailored support to help them to retain and grow. Um, we also want to really make sure that you can learn from each other and create possibilities for you to learn from each other because um, in guiding too often we tend to invent the, the wheel um, in every MO um, instead of you know taking somebody else's wheel and make it even rounder. And we will work with um, new or possible new MOs and associate members. <laughs> We want to continue working on gender mainstreaming and we hope really that also, I mean yesterday's speech by Michelle Paul was one start, we really hope that we can help you also to raise awareness in your MOs about gender questions. And if you then, and we really hope that several MOs will get to the stage where they feel well, maybe we have to look, have a look at our programs, structures, trainings, or other things, and adapt them um, for gender purposes. So how we will do that is by continuing to mainstream gender in WAX as an organization, and especially in Europe region, but we've also heard from the world level that they also want to take up that topic more and more also throughout all of WAX. But it's really also really about supporting you, um, doing your work to either raise awareness or then to um, support your initiatives. And diversity, I mean, in a way, the work is totally parallel um, to the gender work because it's again, it's about bringing the topic on the table, trying to mainstream it in wax in the Europe region, but also. Um, for us, it would be really successive, as many as possible of you would take up that topic by either getting to the stage of raising awareness, which is always the first step, or then even saying, well, we go one step further and we want to adapt um, in our MOs. So again, we're going to continue to support you on that um, with all our skilled volunteers. And I think the key words are really see, so see what happens, then decide to change, and then reach out. The out was covered by my Ukrainian friends, sorry. Um, yeah, so reach out to new publics, to the people who are not yet part of our movement. And then underlying all of this is what we call a vibrant region. So with good people, stable funding, and with a clear purpose where we want to go. The region will act as a keeper of flame, so keeping the guiding values high. Um, and we will act, or continue acting, to um, act as a bridge between the MOs. Now just a short remark before I hand over then to Anita. Some people have remarked to us that after reading the documents, this all sounded really good. 
um, but it was not really concrete. And I hope that after what you've heard yesterday, but also this morning um, in the workshops, you could see what was meant by maybe things that sounded a bit, um, sorry, but things that sounded a bit, you know, not so concrete. Um, and we hope that this will help us to under help us all, and especially you, to understand what we mean by the strategy. But then also as a committee, we had a long discussion um, that we really also want to leave the room for the new ones to come. So we didn't want to come and give them a plan and say, well, in April you're gonna do that, in, in June you're gonna do that. But it's going to be a new committee with a bigger turnover than average, um, just because of the structures. And, and um, we really didn't want to preset all the things, but give them the room to develop their own thing, to have their own focuses that they want to do. So this is why you're not getting an operational plan as detailed as maybe some of you would have wanted. And it also applies in a way to the budget. So you could see in the budget that it's a, a huge chunk called diversity, a huge chunk called um, gender, because we really want the new committee to be able to set their own working plans and their own focuses on that. Um, yeah, I think that's all I, I wanted to give you as an explanation. There will be time for question and answers later on at the end of this session and in the, and in the afternoon as well. And I will now hand over to Anita who will lead us through information on the staff restructuring. I just saw Amanda with her sunglasses. I'm rather taken aback by this. <laughs> um, Natasha and I are going to do the presentation together. We'll hand back and forth. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Oh, I'm doing it. Sorry. Yeah. I forgot. I was so good at it yesterday. Um, so we'll talk about wider organizational change, which includes the, the staff structure. Uh, and I'm going to start very briefly by telling you why I joined WAX and a little about me. Um, so I'm from Canada originally. I grew up in a family and community environment that placed a great emphasis on the importance of community, on voluntary service, and broadly what we would call social justice. So I have always done volunteering throughout my life, and I continue to do that today. Professionally, I started as a journalist, became a communications professional, uh, moved to London to work at Amnesty International's global headquarters, then to UNICEF UK, and, and to WAGS. So that journey is one of entering the international arena, the human rights arena, um, the wider change kind of world. Um, and so both my personal commitment and experience and my professional experience um, came together when I saw the opportunity to join WAGS. And I joined for two reasons. Uh, one is that I have a deep and fundamental commitment to the mission of the organization around girl and young women's empowerment and leadership. And I could see the organization was already showing a wider engagement with the world. And the second reason is that it was a great privilege to be invited to join an organization to help answer questions about how to be ever more dynamic and relevant. And so how did I know the organization wanted to be more dynamic and relevant? Well, it was very, very clear through the exhaustive recruitment process I went through, um, and in particular, one exercise I was asked to do, which is to write a paper about how I was going to spend my first six months including how I was going to address the challenges the organization had identified. There were three pages of challenges that I was given. So, lots. Um, and they were slow. Um, and they were all painting a picture of an organization that wanted to move from where it was now to somewhere different in the future. From a place where membership was declining in some countries, where we were not front of mind for people who cared about girls, and we were not technologically advanced in a very digital world. And to move to a place where we were growing and thriving, where we were the go-to organization on girls and young women, and where we embraced technological possibility. So when I started, I met with staff, world board members, member organizations, girls and young women. And the questions I asked were, what are the opportunities and challenges before WAGS as an organization and the wider movement? What did people think my priorities should be in the first year? 
and what advice did they have for me? And this is all intended to help me understand what the journey from here to there needed to be. I needed to understand where was here, what was our current reality, and where was there? What's the destination we were heading towards? And I pulled all of that together and started feeding it back in what I called reflections. I shared my thoughts with the, the management team, the leadership team at the staff level, then I shared it with the whole staff team, with a smaller chairs team of the world board, and then the whole world board. Um, and basically I said, this is what I have heard and observed and experienced, and I said, what do you think? Do you think that the picture I'm painting is correct? And broadly speaking, the answer was yes. And so in this way, I was in effect a mirror reflecting back into the organization what had been shared with me. And through this process, I wanted to have one conversation that would lead to a shared understanding and a platform for change. So my positive reflections were that we had committed staff who wanted to do better. A world board with drive and vision, some very good innovations in programs and services for member organizations, and some very key partnerships and an engagement with the global organization. But there were big issues, and there were big issues around these three headings, purpose and direction, focus and delivery, shape and feel. <clears throat> so on purpose and direction, where people wanted us to be in future is clear and motivated by a shared understanding of the WAGS organization purpose and direction, but where we were now is some genuine questions and tensions about truly fundamental issues. So really, people were unclear what is the movement and what is WAG's role within it. Is the WAG's organization fundamentally here for girls and young women or for our member organizations? Who's the key customer? Are we about girls' empowerment or women's leadership? What's the balance between advocacy and educational program? And these were not just philosophical debates. These things were played out every single day in the decisions people were taking about what we do, how we spend money, how we work together. And the one thing I was already clear about when I was asked these questions is that we are a membership organization. And if you do not have happy and healthy members, then you can't do anything. There were some future-looking questions, which is how are we actually going to be a global hub? How can we deliver those integrated services? How can we grow the movement? How can we have a bolder brand and voice? And how can we be a truly influential organization? So the next set of questions were around focus and delivery. So in the future, people wanted us to be focused on the priorities that would deliver the best results and to deliver to a high quality. But at present, we were unclear about our priorities. We weren't sure how things were connected with each other and very inconsistent in the quality of our delivery. And crucially, as a staff team, we did not command the confidence of the World Board. They simply did not believe that we would deliver the plan that they had agreed. Now, whether you're in our organization with the World Board, a charity with the Board of Trustees, a company with the Board of Directors, if the people at the top of your organization with fundamental accountability do not trust you to deliver, you are in big trouble. And I have made this very clear to staff that my number one priority at the beginning is to build board confidence and the best way to do that is to deliver what you say you're going to deliver. Other issues around focus and delivery? Lack of very basic management and professional discipline. Lack of urgency, responsiveness and consistency in delivery. Very inconsistent way of designing and delivering programs and support and this thing of reinventing the wheel, again, across a whole range of things. Um, I'm going to tell you very briefly uh, one of the two stories I'll tell you today. Um, my experience before I arrived. I was appointed in December, started in April. I sat down in the January with the, the acting CEO and Nicola, and I said, what should I take part in before I start? But more importantly, how do you want me to spend my first three months? So we agreed a plan. So there were a couple of events I attended in advance. And for each one, I just needed to know, like, where do I need to be, when, do I need to wear a uniform, do I need to read or prepare anything? And it was surprisingly difficult to get answers to those questions. Um, but the one thing I did need an answer to was one event I needed to attend in the summer. I needed to lock down those dates because I was going to go on holidays afterwards. Very difficult to find out when did I need to be at that event. So I asked Wendy, my assistant in my old job, 
Could you just get on the phone? Could you just sort that out for me? So she did that. She found out when I needed to be. Then she figured out which flights I needed to take. She told the WAGS team to book those flights, but by then she wasn't sure they were going to do it. So she said, but then send me the confirmation to make sure that that had all been booked. So that finally got sorted, but with no, you know, with a certain amount of effort. But then Wendy comes into my office and says, do they know when you're starting? And I say, yeah, they know when I'm starting. I say, why are you asking? She says, I keep getting these Outlook invites, you know, for this week between jobs. And I said, ah, you know, I'm just sure it's one of those things. So then I get my communications plan for when I'm, I'm starting. And it has my start date as 10 days before I'm actually starting. So now I wonder, does this organization that I'm about to join as chief executive actually know when I'm starting? So I ask for remote access to my Outlook dialogue. So the good news is my start date is correct. Uh, the bad news is that about half the things we had talked about three months earlier were not yet in the diary, and here we are two and a half weeks away. Um, and like I knew that every Friday I'm meeting with Vicla, but they're not in the diary. So I think, oh, you know, I need to sort this out. And so I think, well, you know, it's hard to do this sometimes remotely. You know, my last day in my old job, I'll just go into WAGS. I'll sit down and I'll go through my diary, I'll go through the comps plan, I'll get it all sorted. So I arrive on that day, and one of the people I'm supposed to be meeting is surprised to see me, because she says, oh, I thought the meeting was cancelled. I said, no, I'm the only one who would have cancelled it, and hey, I'm here. <laughs> so we had that discussion, but the person who was in charge of the diary wasn't there. I didn't know who else to talk to. So I'm finishing one job, I'm going on holidays, and the last email I send is to Nicola, the chair of the world board, saying, Nicola, could you please sort out my diary for when I start so I know what I'm doing? So I start in January with an appropriate strategic level discussion of how should I as chief executive spend my time. I end by asking the chair of the world board to micromanage my diary and she ended up taking a day off work to do so. Clearly unacceptable and this kind of stuff gets repeated time after time. Um, on shape and feel, in future people want an organization where people are valued, well led and managed with a structure that helps us deliver well but at present, an internal review we did, people said that WAGS is not a great organization to work for. We have a structure and ways of working that hinder us from performing well. A structure that is top heavy and siloed, overlapping or missing functions, weak management skills and poor collaboration, poor behaviors and a lack of shared values. So again, one last quick story before I hand over to Natasha. Uh, in the budget planning and, and activity planning that we were doing for 2016, you know, you go through various stages of this process and two things really shocked me. One was, slower, it excites me so much. Um, so there were various leadership things that were in the global plan and in various regional plans and I just wanted to make sure we weren't double counting. I wanted to make sure everything was kind of, you know, a unique event and that they were all firm and so forth. And I asked various questions about this, and finally I just said, who can actually stand up and tell me that they have an overview of what we're actually doing as an organization on leadership next year? And nobody could. It, so it was all over the shop. And then on money, it came, became very clear that actually the way we were raising money and the plans we had for spending it were completely disconnected and that we might have plans to raise a certain amount of money, but it wasn't necessary for the things that we were planning. And so we had to do a lot of 11th hour work to actually get these things to join up in a reasonable way. Um, so this, should, well actually at the same, so Andy and I are sitting in a room talking about hundreds of thousands of pounds on either side of the equation and literally next door, staff keep going into the fund development department asking for 5,000 pounds for this and 10,000 pounds for that as if it's a cash machine. And we just said, no, 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 that's not how it works. You know, you decide what you're gonna do, you set a budget and then you spend it accordingly. And it was really quite bizarre. Um, but anyway, so the way I summarize all of this is I think that we are 20 years behind other modern organizations and I have said that we have two years to catch up because the world is moving fast and I want us to arrive at the world conference with people feeling that something is better in the way WAGS is operating. So, so when I said all of this, I asked people for feedback and broadly speaking, they said they welcomed an, an honest shared appraisal 
that we need to be better at talking about our challenges. They were shocked and embarrassed by some of what I said, but actually not surprised. So, on the back of all that information that Anita collected in, in a very short period of time when she joined WAGS, <clears throat> uh, we commenced to uh, build a change process that we called Achieving Our Ambition. And there were four key elements to this process. So first of all, um, we had to develop a business plan and budget for 2016 that was connected. And it was going to, going to ensure that we had clear line of sight of our core activities and measures of success for our work through this transition period. Um, we've been working on a people strategy, which is about uh, ensuring that WAGS has a, uh, is a leading organisation in the not-for-profit sector for staff and volunteers. We've worked on the organisational structure, which has been driven by the clear call for action to improve WAGS's ways of work and deliver the organisation's strategic ambitions. And there's been a piece of work central to all of this on organisational cultural values. That's the values of the, the business of WAGS. And it's, it's to help us make the explicit behaviours and cultures that define how we go about our, our, our work. And to oversee this entire pr a process, Anita created an organisational change team that included individuals that were leading each of these pieces of work. Now, they agreed to nine key success criteria for this change process. So we defined what the organisation would look and feel like in the long run if we were successful with this transformation. And it included things like ensuring we had a strategic staff leadership team, that we were an organisation focused on innovation and improved service delivery, and that there were positive cultural values and we had a connected and engaged workforce. So the organisational cultural piece was really central to the Achieving Our Ambition project uh, and was about developing uh, cultural values that would glue and bind together WAG staff and volunteers in the way that we, we worked. So we engaged uh, internal and external expertise, we consulted, ex consulted extensively with staff and world board members um, over a period of several months and we identified uh, the six key values that you can see listed there. We felt these were critical for us to be working well together. So you can see therefore in our work, we are focused on being member driven, brave, inclusive, empowering, transparent and professional. And for those of you on uh, global working committees, uh, working groups and committees, subcommittees of the World Board, you would have seen these because we're rolling this out through our volunteer structures as well as our staff structures. Anita's already mentioned the challenge of pulling together our business plan for 2016. So we, um, we, we've really focused our energy on four key areas of work, um, which cover the six global outcomes of the, the global strategic plan. But um, <clears throat> obviously we're focusing on membership growth. That's been specifically driven by the membership development strategy that, that the World Conference approved in Hong Kong. Uh, there's been a, a big focus on membership services. How do we improve the services we're delivering to our MOs? How do we uh, bring more value to our member organisations? We've focused on positioning the organisation and we've been focusing on fund development. Then with the people strategy, um, this is uh, about designing a clear and strong approach for how we're going to develop WAGs as people and create a productive workplace. Uh, and the development of the people strategy has had extensive input from WAG staff and volunteers and it's designed to embrace and support our wider talent pool. So you can see some of the, the key elements of this strategy around leadership and management, uh, requiring a high performance culture, being a diverse and healthy organisation, looking at people development and teamwork, uh, engagement and communications, planning, resourcing and organisation design and reward and recognition. And now let's turn to the organisational structure. Now I expect you're all very familiar with the structure that I'm showing here. This is the WAG's governance structure. I, I hope you're all familiar with it. So we have the World Board, uh, 12 elected members and five regional chairs. We have regional committees that are subcommittees of the World Board. We have other standing uh, subcommittees of the World Board in audit, risk, finance, fund development and so forth. 
And, and this training, we have three working groups, which I, I hope you've all heard about by now, Global Engagement, Membership Growth and Membership Services. And I want to be very clear that none of the organisational restructure we're talking about has changed any of this. This all remains as it always has. So we're not talking about changing our governance structures. Now, so on the staff structure side then, when I was elected to the World Board and when Anita joined WAGS, this was what the department structure of WAGS looked like. So there are seven departments and eight people on the staff leadership team together with the CEO. So finance and business support, governance, fund development, there was a chief operating officer with four departments beneath her. So we started the process of reviewing the staff structure with external benchmarking. So we talked to WASM, we talked to the European Youth Forum, Save the Children International, the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent, and we talked with McKinsey consultants who um, had previously consulted for us. So it was a mix of organisations working with youth and volunteers and working internationally. And some of the key points that came out of this research. Secretariats are generally moving towards a shared leadership model uh, with their members and building a sense of community. Resources and structures are flexible to respond quickly and effectively, and there is a high degree of delegation recommended. Relationship management of members is critical, and generally members are segmented and resources are deployed effectively through those different segments. There's a culture of responsiveness, and this has to be supported by delegation and simple management structures. Most organisations still had geographical structure of some sort, but some had a matrix management with a technical line of reporting in addition. Uh, several commented that events management worked more effectively in a centralised way, and knowledge management was highlighted as essential. We also spoke internally with the leadership team and regional directors to gain their understanding of our staff structure. And the key themes that came out of these conversations Centralisation of all programs, all program delivery into one team was, was necessary. We need to consider the most effective way of supporting regional governance structure and a continuation of the trend to move towards specialist rather than generalist roles when supporting MOs. There needed to be a separation of relationship management with our members from service delivery. We needed to improve our support to volunteers. There needed to be stronger emphasis uh, placed on external communications as well as our marketing, so the, the brand piece and public relations. There needs to be strengthening of professional support functions. We needed to have increased accountability. There needed to be reduced scope for duplication. And we needed a smaller staff leadership team, but we needed it to act more cohesively and responsively. And we also looked at all the information we had collected within WAGS because the World Board had actually started a very large process of consultation and self-evaluation and self-reflection when we started as a World Board in 2014. So we had a lot of feedback from MOs through surveys. Most significantly, we'd just undertaken the 2015 annual membership survey, which was very valuable. So once again, thank you for contributing to that. Uh, and we... we you know, in that survey, we had explored the value and relevance of our membership services and asked what you liked and didn't like about what WAGS was delivering to you. And in late 2014, early 2015, we completed an organisational development report that reviewed the performance and processes of the central business of WAGS. Um, <clears throat> and this exercise actually reinforced the case for change. And the, the study recommended that a review of departmental functions in the future would be helpful to identify synergies in the way that work was organised and that we needed to simplify our structure. And in addition, the report suggested that WAGS could benefit from examining the organisational hierarchy from a talent management perspective to introduce more opportunities for more people to progress their careers within WAGS. Uh, the New World Board was in the middle of setting out its ambitious business plans to deliver on the 2015-2017 strategic plan. So there was a lot of activity going on around what we were setting out as what needed to be delivered by WAGS. And then there was emerging work on the WAGS value proposition and branding, which was again reinforcing the need for change. And I'm very excited to be talking to you about that tomorrow. And you'll hear more about that work.
So based on all this, we developed a proposal for a simplified structure based around four departments, corporate services, global programs, membership, and engagement. The World Board had decided that the decision-making on new structure was a management one, so ultimately my decision, and I designed the process accordingly. Uh, the first phase of consultation was about the, the higher level organization-wide structure. Uh, that was in the form of a written proposal which was shared with all staff, the entire World Board and all regional committees and we had various ways of providing feedback um, to that. I wanted to ensure that we were building confidence through the process but also needed to respect the confidentiality element of it because ultimately this affects people's jobs. Uh, this is what the overall organogram looks like and over there on the side you will see a colored version which reflects where we are now in the process of appointing people to real jobs and that's been designed so you can take photos of it to, to remember. Just going through each of these departments quickly. So Andy now heads up what's called corporate services. Uh, governance, the function as you know it, uh, both uh, the constitutional and active board servicing. Uh, bringing in a corporate planning process so that planning I talked about earlier is done better. Finance, which we're discussing quite a lot here. Uh, human resources and organizational development, moving from a kind of compliance approach to a talent development approach. Uh, an IT function, we didn't have a head of technology before, yet we had ambitious technology plans, so we've built in that capability. And asset management, including world centers, so it's the, the running of the buildings, as it were, of world centers, um, the content comes in programs. Uh, so global programs, this responds to the desire for all our program delivery to be under one roof. Uh, there's three elements, program innovation, it's one person, but a lot of what's coming out of membership services requires us to think much differently about how we do it, wanted to build in some capacity. Program delivery, all the work that we're doing now, you know, stop the violence, free being me, educational program leadership, all going to be managed under one person, um, and events management, so the various events that we run as a, as a global organization, whether they're within region or, or genuinely global events, will be done by a, a, a smallish team. Uh, then the membership department, um, here was uh, what for people has felt like the biggest um, cultural change, is moving from a structure which was largely based around regional teams and moving it to one that's largely based around functional specialisms. So the first team here is membership development. So this is the growth function. You've heard about the rapid response team. So that will sit here. So that's about, again, separating away from day-to-day -day work, the, the capacity and the energy to drive things forward quickly when we can. Uh, member relations, you'll see on that chart, it's probably the largest team, and this is about absolutely getting better at managing relations with our member organizations, which you will know is a skill. Um, and delivering some of the support to member organizations, but not expecting those people to be the experts in every single thing we do. Uh, research and organizational learning, a function that could sit anywhere, but we've put it here because we think the thing we first need to get to grips with is really knowing and understanding our member organizations. And then volunteer engagement, responsible for two things, uh, supporting the regional committee, so the role that regional directors have previously played is being played by the individuals in this team, um, but also developing a wider approach to support the organizations um, uh, work with volunteers, how we better attract, support, retain global volunteers and make sure that it's a positive experience. And an engagement department bringing together fundraising, communications and advocacy, all externally facing functions. So the first two teams here are focused on fundraising, bringing in the money. Communications and Brands specifically introduces a media relations function because we want to raise our voice, build our profile. Advocacy, as we've had it before, but a more explicit brief around developing relations with other organizations. For example, we're now discussing a strategic partnership with UN Women. So how do all of these changes bring, benefit, bring benefits to WAVE? Well, our plan is to become a more strategic, integrated organization that routinely innovates and collaborates. The centralisation of resources will ensure we operate far more effectively and efficiently. We want to achieve more with no more resource. 
It will enable us to deploy resources in a way that ensures optimum, optimum and timely solution for WAGs and for our members. As you've heard Anita mention, we will build additional capabilities into volunteer management, a topic that I'm personally very happy about. Um, we need to get better at managing and supporting our global volunteers as well as our region committees. There will also be additional capabilities in PR and program innovation. We will modify core functions in membership and programs to address the gaps that you have identified and told us that we're not delivering to you. And most importantly, all of these changes will place member organisations in the centre of what we do because we recognise that member organisations are our core customers, the core reason that the global organisation of WAGS exists. So overall, you can expect to be seeing then in the future better service and support, better relationship management, uh, joined up programs and support that are focused on the priorities of member organisations and tailored to your needs. This is what you told us that you wanted, tailored support. There'll be more advanced notice and better management of events for member organisations. There'll be better technological capability, including a fully functional global hub. And we'll be better at building our brand profile and helping you to build yours so that together we can demonstrate more effectively the impact of the Girl Guide and Girl Scout movement on the world. Uh, turning specifically to some Europe-specific questions, this is the current um, Europe uh, regional team structure. Uh, most regional teams have a regional director and two staff, you know, sometimes a bit more when there's fixed-term contracts. The Europe team is larger, linked to the additional activity that member organisations pay for through the additional voluntary contribution. Um, I'll just highlight two functions here. There's an events officer here and a funding and project coordinator function. What I want to do is, so basically if there's three posts that every regional team has, effectively there are five extra posts which are funded from the additional voluntary contribution along with the costs of running the events and the working groups and so forth. So it's a little hard to see, so I might point at it. So where, do those, where does that sit now? Um, okay, I can't. So if you look under the global programs, events management, you'll see plus one. So we have three people in that team. We would have had just two people, but because there are so many extra events that Europe runs, the Academy, Roverway, you know, all the events you've been hearing about, we put in that events post which you already have, just move it over and it's, it's in this events management team. So it's just being run differently and you'll see that it's uh, Sophie in that position. Um, if you go over to the engagement area under strategic partnerships, that the current structure has a post to manage the funding relationship with the European Union. So that function continues, but it's largely a fundraising and reporting discipline, so it sits in a fundraising team. So they're same functions, more or less, sitting in different teams. Um, in terms of supporting the wider range of volunteer activities that the Europe region has, we have put, if you look under membership, at the volunteer engagement, we've added an additional post there specifically to support that wider range of volunteer activity. Um, and because there are um, a number of work streams, which you have been hearing about and will continue to hear about, we've added two uh, people, two extra posts to the uh, member relations team specifically to support that level of activity. So I know you have questions which will come out of finance about how do decisions get made, about the, the spending of the additional voluntary contribution. So it obviously follows the wider, wider strategy that you've heard from Karina. This is essentially just the new structure version of the positions that already exist. Okay, so um, some other general questions and that have come up throughout this process as we've been consulting uh, across our uh, global committees and region committees. Um, are there any changes to regions and regional committees? Well, no, uh, there are no changes to regions and committees, but they will be serviced differently or supported differently through the volunteer engagement team. So, uh, again, a reminder that that um, now sits under the membership department, that volunteer engagement piece of work. And what about regional representation um, at events and with member organisations? So, in terms of working with member organisations, you might uh, interface or interact with regional committee members, 
the relationship manager for that member organisation, or if the need is, is there, you might have a specialist come from one of the function, functional specialists within the organisation to come and support you as a member organisation. And at regional events, again, you, you, you'll see regional committee members there. You might see heads of um, membership or programs, our directors that oversee those departments, or again, the relationship manager, managers, depending on the type of event it is and, and who's coordinating and if it's an MO-specific event. Uh, will MO still have a contact and support person? The answer is yes. And what about staff knowledge of regions and, M and MOs? Well, uh, this restructure is not about reducing staff. We, we, uh, retaining staff is a priority. Um, and we, as you've heard from Anita, having staff who are focused on supporting our MOs um, is a, a core piece of this um, staff structure. And having all of those staff sitting in one team um, will support better collaboration um, across the world so that we don't duplicate work in regional silos. It will enable us to offer more effective tailored support so we can efficiently deliver services to clusters of MOs who may not necessarily sit within one region uh, and, and avoid duplication. And just uh, a final point on some other specific European questions. I mean, a wider question that came up in the consultation is, does this mean all staff will be based in London? The answer is no. And again, if you look at the organogram over there, you will, we have staff, about half of our staff are based in different parts of the world. They continue to be based in those parts of the world and you will see that wherever they're based, that they, um, they, they have jobs in the new structure. And as people leave, you know, in the, in the normal course of life, we will continue to make sure we hire people based around the world because that's what you do when you're a global organization. Specifically, are we going to continue to have a Brussels office? The answer is yes. The, the change of structure does not change any of that. Uh, what about the European contribution? There's obviously a wider governance discussion that you, you have around that, but in terms of how does the structure affect that, I've, I've already explained that the staff that you're already paying for are there line managed in different ways, but still delivering what you have asked them to deliver through that contribution. But we will also make sure that um, the fund, the money itself, is considered as one restricted contribution and managed as one chunk of money, notwithstanding the detailed questions you will have for Andy, but that you will have clear line of sight of how that money is spent, and I will have confidence that in my management team we're not losing sight of that. Uh, in terms of the extra European events, again, they will continue to happen. We've built in the staff capacity. The voluntary contribution continues to pay for those events that you value so much. Um, and in terms of how we collaborate with WASM at the Europe level, that brief currently held by the regional director will be held by the head of volunteer engagement. Um, I recognize that's a lot to absorb in one go. Uh, we'll have formal questions this afternoon. You know, I'm around until Tuesday to answer any questions. Um, and just to leave you with that final quote. now but let's just quick have a very quick energizer in between to get us all active and um, Sarah is our woman for the energizer <laughs> Okay, so do you remember the things that we did yesterday? Yes. So I will do the, the stretching again so please stand up. Start again with the shoulders because this is really important if you're sitting a long day and just watching at the screen. And do really good circles, like really big ones. And you can also have your arms like this. And don't forget that you also can do it in the other direction. Now do a little bit of a stretching. Do you feel it? And now try to jump a little bit. Okay. 
Thank you. That's quite a good fun bit here. Okay, thank you to Anita Kuman and Natasha for what you presented so far. And we're now moving to finance after which we take questions to all of the subjects. We're Depending on time, we'll take them before lunch and after lunch. We definitely take them after lunch, but depending on time, we might take them before lunch as well. Thank you. I noticed I didn't participate in the energy lesson there because I've done my backing. So if anybody happens to be an osteopath in their life outside of guiding, come see me afterwards. Um, so we're going to talk about finance. Um, I'm actually going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about regional allocations and membership fees generally. They're generic slides that are going to all of the regional committees. Um, I'm then going to talk about the WAG's general fund allocation to Europe and what's happened to that since the last regional conference. And then I'm going to talk briefly about the proposed budget for 2017. And then I'm going to talk about the um, proposed budget for 2017-2019. Obviously we've had quite a lot of discussion about that already. And then Rob Vandenberg is going to talk about the uh, actual Europe contribution that's proposed for the coming triennium. So, this isn't the slides that I thought I was going to see. Okay, let's uh, zip forward. I may only be talking about two things in that case. So, historically, uh, Europe region has been allocated a fixed sum of money to pay for regional governance events, country visits, and so forth. Um, and a portion of the regional team. Now you will remember that at your last regional conference in Berlin uh, that a motion was passed um, seeking to bring Europe in line with other regions so that basic costs around staffing and so forth were not being subsidised by a Europe contribution. So as you may remember, other regions, those three staff that Anita talked about, they would have had a budget for whatever they cost. So obviously people cost different amounts of money in different parts of the world. And uh, whatever that cost was, the budget was varied accordingly. And that wasn't the case historically in Europe, where you got a fixed sum of money. And it hadn't changed for several years, so that meant that uh, effectively uh, your extra money was being used to subsidise those staff. So a series of discussions took place just after I started at the beginning of 2014. Um, Karina was involved, the World Chair was involved, I was involved, um, a few other people from member organisations were involved. And there was a, a, you know, an absolute acknowledgement that the Europe contribution had been used to cover the cost of some staff and activities that elsewhere would have been covered by WAG's general fund. So there was no attempt to deny that. Um, but it was accepted by all parties at that time that it wouldn't be possible to remedy the matter straight away. And so the following position was approved. So first of all, in 2014, the World Board agreed to allocate an additional £50,000, which at that time translated as about €60,000, of WAG's general fund to the Europe region, um, notionally as an additional contribution to all the staff. I'm not sure that it actually was used to pay for staff in the end, because there were delays in recruiting to the posts that it was intended for. But it wasn't clawed back, so it did stay with the region. And then the second phase of that, uh, and it was intended that in 2015 to 17, um, the board agreed to an additional 70,000 euros of general funds um, for 15, 16 and 17 budgets. But we acknowledge that even after that, most likely uh, Europe contribution currently in the current year is probably still being used to subsidise costs to the tune of about 20 uh, pounds, 20,000 pounds or 20,000, 26,000 euros. 
However, oh, no, sorry. And a letter was sent to you all um, in May 2014, setting out that agreement. So I hope you all remember receiving that letter. Um, as I said, it's accepted that the Europe contribution is still in this current financial year, subsidising basic costs by about £20,000, €26,000. Um, but that will be eradicated from next year, so earlier actually than we originally anticipated, by the new staff structure that Anita has just articulated. So from next year, Europe contribution will only pay for staff that actually perform Europe specific tasks. And she's already talked about uh, those posts and where they sit in the new structure. Um, there's about five. Um, we currently anticipate the cost of those parts, posts will be about €224,000, and that's the figure that you've seen in the budget, the annual budget that was proposed in the, the paper. Um, interestingly, that is actually €40,000 less than the staff cost that was charged to Europe contribution last year. Um, so in the event that any of those staff carry out work that should not be funded from Europe contribution, an appropriate proportion of their salary will be charged back to WAG's general funds. So if we have that events manager in the global programmes team, and actually you decide you don't want so many events, and it only takes up 50% of her time, then 50% of her budget, of the cost of her, will be charged back to WAG's general funds, not to your uh, additional contribution. And similarly, uh, if any of the staff based at the Europe office um, are not working on activity that should be, um, yeah, that should not be charged to Europe contribution, then that proportion of the office costs would also be borne by the WAX general fund. And I currently anticipate, given who's been appointed to the different posts, and in particular posts that staff at the Brussels office, the posts they've been appointed to, I expect probably 50% of the costs of the office will end up being charged back to WAG's general funds. Uh, Europe Contribution will also fund the extra committee meeting that happens every year. So that's traditionally the one in November, I think. Um, any extra events that you decide you want, additional visits, as described in the budget paper. WAG's general funds will continue to fund the cost of normal yeah, governance yeah, events, so that means the, the March annual uh, committee meeting alongside all the other regions, the Triennial Conference, and others for general activity costs as per other regions. So this whole issue about Europe contribution subsidising uh, WAG's general funds will disappear from next year. Uh, this links into the questions that I answered yesterday, so that we will be improving, my finance team will be improving the way that Europe region income and expenditure is recorded so that the regional committee can provide can be provided with more and better financial information, which clearly shows how your money is used, so that they can take decisions in the event that more money is available. Come on to that in a minute. So this is now possible because the finance function that was centralised, uh, the finance function was centralised at the end of last year. Uh, as I talked to some individuals uh, and a group earlier in the week. Uh, previously, the financial accounting function was done by a private company that I don't think understood the information needs of the committee. Oops. Again, once a year, at least, the committee will publish an annual review that will provide information on the use of your money um, and the current position in terms of reserves. So there will be much, much more transparency than you've received in recent years. Um, and I'm quite happy to add on to that, the promise that I made yesterday, around the quarterly financial figures that will go to the committee, and which they, they will be at liberty if they wish to share with you. Um, in the event that actual costs are significantly less than any of the individual proposed budgets, and there have been some discussions about particular lines, and we've admitted that in some cases we don't quite know what was in there. So the office cost slide is the one that people have raised in particular. So in the event that actual costs are significantly less than the amounts that we've shown, then uh, the regional committee may 
either spend that on other things, and I'm sure there's a limited, limitless pool of things that you would like them to do for you, but alternatively, we have raised the option in the report that the regional committee could give member organisations the option of reducing their contributions in the last year of the tri triangle. So that's broadly how um, the impacts of the decision that you took last time have been implemented. So you, know, you raised an issue about Europe contribution being uh, used to, to uh, subsidise activity that elsewhere would be funded from WAX general funds. That issue has now been resolved. So looking forward to the actual financial plan for 17 to 20, I've got quite a few slides here and I may zip through a couple because I think we've, we've discussed some of the points at length already. Um, so the budget paper that you've had focuses on the use of your additional money, including the reserves uh, plus income from grants, but not what WAG's general funds will be used for. It is a fairly insignificant amount of money in the context of the much bigger amount of money that you contribute. So the average amount that a region would receive, if you take the staffing out of the equation, is about £50,000, so sixty, sixty-five thousand €65,000 a year. So it's not a huge amount of money in the scheme of things. Uh, the figures in the budget are based on the assumption that, the, that you will approve the proposals about the Europe contribution payments, which we will discuss shortly. And I think it's important to stress what I've said uh, elsewhere in conversations with individuals or groups. It's in, it's, and, um, Rob alluded to this earlier, which is in terms of what the process was for formulating the budget. So people have asked, how is it that you can set a budget where you don't actually know what certain things will cost? And essentially it's because what we really did was work out how much do we want to charge people for their Europe contribution. The sense that we were getting from many MOs was that you didn't want to pay as much. In some cases, you couldn't pay as much because um, of your own financial circumstances. So we worked on the basis that we ought to be looking at a kind of a 10% reduction in income from Europe contribution. And then we formulated a budget based on that level of income. Um, so, you know... Uh, Somebody else isn't happy either. Um, so overall, over the course of the whole 17 to, that should be 17 to 19, I apologise, uh, we're proposing to spend 1.5 million euros, and that would be funded by, in year, Europe contribution, receipt, Europe contribution receipts of about 1.1 million euros, external grants of about 360,000 euros, and then the balance from Europe contri contribution reserves all four. So that 26,000 is basically the difference between the reserves that we anticipate being brought forward after we've taken out the provision for bad debt and the 85,000, which was the target level of reserves, it was agreed at a previous conference. Uh, these figures are already in the paper, so I'm not going to dwell on this uh, slide. Um, and similarly here, so as you can see, there's a provision that's been allocated to the regional committee meeting, uh, the one in, in November. Um, an additional provision has been made and has been applied to maintaining visibility with the U European youth environment with social partners. Questions earlier about the office and entity costs that are in the budget and questions about why they're higher and you know, Rob has provided an honest asked answer for that. We don't quite know what is in there at the moment but we are digging and that will become clear in the uh, fullness of time. At the moment, they are predominantly funded from the Europe contribution on the basis that the office and the company, the AISBL, would not exist unless you'd made that decision in the past to have it. However, as I've said before, a proportion of the costs will be funded from WAX general funds if staff based in that office are carrying out tasks funded from general funds. And that will be the case. We already know that. 
Um, the committee in March had a discussion about the uh, Friends of Europe region. I well, hope there had been some discussions previously, maybe at a re previous regional committee, about the need to revitalise or revive uh, the Friends of Europe region as a, a fundraising uh, group of volunteers. Um, the view that they took was they didn't see any reason why we shouldn't do that, um, but they didn't think it was something that the committee themselves should lead on. So the idea was that there would be a sum of money allocated within the budget, which would effectively be a one-off grant to a group of volunteers willing to take responsibility for relaunching that Friends of Europe. But of course, if nobody comes forward and volunteers, that money will be recycled back into the general budget and spent on something else. Country visits, I'm not going to dwell on that, you know what they are. Hardship fund. So there was an acknowledgement uh, by the committee that a number of member organisations are struggling financially. Um, in some cases to pay their contribution and in other cases to attend and fully participate in the life of the region. Uh, you know, there are some people in the room I know who've had a very difficult time over the last couple of years in just you know, paying their bills and so forth, for, for, for a variety of reasons. So the concept was launched of a hardship fund, which on the one hand would be used in a similar way to the global membership fee support fund to support organisations <coughs> in terms of payment of their Europe contribution. And it would work in broadly the same way as the membership fee support fund. And some of you here are already benefiting from that global fund. And secondly, a sum of money to enable participation. So effectively travel grants or accommodation grants to allow people who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford it to attend the World Conference or the regional conferences or the IC Forum and so forth. To make sure that there was high levels of participation in the activities that you fund yourself and other things. And again, as uh, Karina said earlier, so we're proposing to spend at least, I would say, 327,000 over the course of the trial on additional activity to address the key themes of your Europe strategy, so growth, gender mainstreaming, diversity, vibrancy. Now essentially that 327,000 is a balancing figure. So you'll remember what I said earlier about the process through which we went through to set the budget which started off with the assumption about how much money would there be to spend. And what was left, after all those other things, was 327,000. So that was divided between those four uh, broad areas of activity. And this is where things like Roverway and Academy and the IC Forum would come from. Now clearly, if some of those other expenditure budgets appear to transpire to be greater than they actually need to be, then what the new committee will undoubtedly do is roll those additional funds into here. So you will get more activity. Well, Ian decides at some point to reduce the amount of reserves that you hold. This can be rolled into here as well. And you can have even more uh, activity. And equally, if that level of debt, notional debt, Europe contribution reduces, the, the bad debt provision can reduce and those resources can be rolled into this larger fund. So there is a way built into this budget of spending more if more is available and if you want more to be spent. Uh, external funds. So the, Europe, the region has been very successful in generating external funding. So having that additional post in the structure, which is retained in the new structure, has brought money in from for example, the European Commission. And at this stage, we're assuming that around 360,000 euro, euros could be generated over the triennium. In reality, it could be more than that. It might be less. Um, and in the event that the target isn't met, then expenditure will obviously need to be reduced accordingly, so as not to increase the burden on the contribution. So, the question about reserves, then. So the budget, the end figure on the budget, is an assumed carried forward reserve level at the end of 2019. 
of 85,000 euros. And that's based on a decision that I understand was taken at a previous regional conference, I'm not sure it was the last one, it may have been the one before, to retain a degree of reserves, which I understand was to uh, cover the costs of potentially closing down the Europe office. And I hasten to add again, not that there are any plans to do so. Um, but it was your decision, I understand, to maintain reserves in the event that you did decide to close down uh, the office. Um, and obviously that would have to pay then for staff redundancy costs, perhaps early termination, but at least that costs money as well. Now if you decide that you don't want to maintain that level of reserves, then obviously the, the funds that are freed up can be rolled back into the main budget and they can be used to fund more activity. And as I said before, you should know that in addition to that £85,000, there is already a separate provision of €72,500 72 to cover unpaid Europe contributions still outstanding from previous years. So if they are paid, again, that provision can be reduced and that money can be rolled into the general funds that can then be spent on more activity. So that's my bit. I thought there were going to be some other slides as well about general kind of financial issues and membership fees of all but they appear to have disappeared. Uh, but Rob's going to come up here now and talk about to your contribution. After what Andy Nett just said, I go one slide back on the provision. We have repayment plans with all the MOs on this 72,000 euros, so it's not that we don't expect we will not have it in. Uh, so we have a kind of idea when it comes in, but uh, for accounting purposes we cannot use it because we have not have the cash in. So that's what it is. So everybody here is willing to pay that amount, but have difficulties in paying it directly now. Um, Europe contribution. The Europe Committee um, uh, is proposing not to change the system of how everything is done and calculated because we are already changing so much that we thought it is wise not to make it more complicated. So we use the same system. The only thing is that uh, at the last World Conference we all decided to have different bands than the ones before. So we say we keep in line with the bands uh, of the world so that you don't have in Europe a system and in the world another system and we always have to explain why there is a difference. But we don't uh, go for the option what is in the world to increase the top, uh, uh, yeah, this is the top, the, the, the J watts with the 20% extra what was in the world uh, uh, proposed. So we keep the same system, we keep the bands as the world is using where we have I and J just paying 100%. Uh, and uh, as we all agreed as well that one MO can never pay more than 50% and uh, the same minimum payments as we had proposed before. And uh, because as we really felt as a committee, and Andy has mentioned it before as well, we have the reserves and uh, we really think as well um, at uh, within the current economic climate it's not worth asking for the exact same amount, so that's why we reduced it with 10% to make sure that we are going to be able to use the reserves and uh, deliver you what you decided, what you wanted to have be delivered. That's it. Thank you to Andy and thank you to Rob um, for this presentation. Um, we're now moving forward to q and I know it's 12.30, so it is lunchtime, but let me take two or three questions before lunchtime, and then we move to the rest, because I'm sure there are a number of questions, and I do want to use um, as much time as possible. Um, and I know lunch is quick, you, I hope sandwiches again. So, um, But I'll t I would like to take questions on different subjects. And I would like to start on questions on the strategic direction which Natasha presented and um, on the European regional plan, operational plan, um, which Corinna presented. So these two topics. We'll come back to staff and financing after lunch. But let's just may I ask for questions for the first two subjects, the more 
content strategic direct world and Europe. Who would like to speak on this subject? Questions from Germany? Anybody else? Okay, Germany, you've got the floor. Fabian, uh, I see, speaking on behalf of the German delegation. Uh, I wanted to uh, clarification on the vocabulary sustainable. What is your definition of a sustainable movement? What does that include and what are concrete measures to achieve that? That's a question for Natasha. Um, any more questions? Yeah. Greece, is it? No. Switzerland, sorry. Hello, I'm Catherine, uh, IC Wise from Switzerland. I have a question about the, um, the strategic framework. Um, in the global strategy that is still valid, we had a Vision 2020 framework with two main goals. And as far as I could see, they were not in the plan anymore now. And I would like to ask, I mean, this was, you know, voted for on the World Conference and why is it not in the strategic plan anymore now? As I understood, it was a Vision 2020 thing, so it's not over yet. Okay. So Natasha, would you, could you answer the, both of those questions? Um, I think if there are these two questions, I would like to have them answered before lunch, if that's fine for Natasha. Um, yeah. Because then we are more or less set. <coughs> oh, there's another one. Okay. Are there many more? Because I'm now checking. Are there more on this subject? Questions? Okay, Slovenia. Urstov, um, Slovenian Skies. We would like to understand, I mean, it was said that you will share the staff knowledge over the, uh, uh, about the MOs, that, that's being shared in structure. So for us, we would like to understand how um, this new structure is going to provide Ampers the knowledge around the MOs and issues that are important to the MOs. I hope it's clear. Thank you. We are, um, I'll, we'll keep that question for after lunch because then we do structures um, after lunch. But um, uh, you might want to answer the first two questions. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I've forgotten which countries asked the questions, but the answer to the second question, the Vision 2020, and there were two goals written into that, that remains in the strategic framework. So I've presented you with a very high level summary, uh, but those two goals remain embedded in the, the detail of that strategy and planning document. Uh, so we're not uh, removing the priorities that we had identified for up to 2020 from the last World Conference. It's really a reorganisation to help us focus our resources appropriately. In terms of what do we mean by sustainable movement, uh, we don't have a specific list of what it means to be a sustainable movement. It's certainly <coughs> something that we would welcome feedback on. From the, from the work that we're doing around examining the role of WAGs in the Girl Guide, Girl Scout movement, the types of things that we would consider necessary for us to be a sustainable movement would be that we have sufficient funding so that we can operate. Um, we have a, we're offering a quality Girl Guide, Girl Scout experience so that there's a reason for us to exist, that we're delivering our purpose and our mission, uh, and that, that we're delivering impact and have leadership in the global community as the go-to organisation for girls and young women. But if you have more specific, uh, if you would like the World Board to consider, please provide that feedback to us. Thank you, thank you Natasha. Um, and thank you to Slovenia for raising the next question after lunch, which goes was the question about structures and how the committees are supported. Um, before we move to lunch, I have one more announcement. They're still missing a lot of registration for the MO sharing session. So before you go out for lunch now, please sign in for the MO sharing session and because we will remove the sheets after lunch. So um, 
please um, use the opportunity for that good discussion. Um, I hope you don't forget your questions over. Come back here and we continue with the Q&A.